Amen. Wow. Welcome to church. Come on. Welcome to Scent Church, right? Come on. It is so good to be here this morning. I cannot believe we're finally in our new building. It has been a big journey to get here, and I'm so grateful you came to the first service to celebrate what God's doing. If you're new today, I'd love to meet you after service. I'd love to give you a social distance hug like this, maybe pat you on the back, and we can become best friends. I hope we can do that. And uh, yeah, so if you're new, I'd love to, uh, to have you fill out the Connect card as well so we can spam you all week long. I'm kidding, we're not going to do that. But uh, yeah, we're so glad you're here. We hope you feel welcomed. And also, we pray that you would meet with God today and that this would be like, like, that's our prayer every Sunday. We don't want this to just be like a cool service. We want it to be an encounter. That's what we pray. That's the language we use, encounter. We want to encounter God. So I pray that that would happen. As Katie was sharing about the or about the tears in the carpet, I know that's going to happen. You know, we're going to have these stairs carpeted uh, this next week. And the reason we do that is we wanna, or because we want to be a church that's all about the altar, right? We want to be a church that gets at the altar, that's crying before the Lord. So we can't have wood sticky stairs, right? So, so those will be carpeted because we want to really go after the Lord. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel and my wife's Emily, she just shared with you. And about 10 years ago, we helped uh, start the Chi Alpha Campus Ministry as freshmen at UNI. And we were crazy kids, didn't know what we were doing, but we're part of this little group of students that started this Chi Alpha. And after our sophomore year, we ended up moving up to, up to Minneapolis so I could go to Bible college. I felt called to ministry. And I remember that first semester at Bible college, I was so just kind of confused, like, what does God have for my life? What's going on? I had this great community at UNI, and now I'm here with all these super Christians, and they dress better than me. I don't know what's going on. You know, the Christian kids try to look really cool. You know, just stop trying so hard. But uh, so anyways, I remember that that first semester, there was a church planting conference that happened. And, and for me, I was really loose. I was very open-handed with what uh, the call was on my life. I didn't know what it was. It was just, you know, pursuing God. I knew that was ministry. I just didn't know what kind of ministry. And that church planting comments, I remember God just really spoke to my heart during the chapel services. I remember I was at the altar, probably around here in the chapel. And, and during that season, too, I should share, you know, we really missed Iowa. You know, we love Iowa. Like, I know some people don't like Iowa, don't like cornfields. I love Iowa. People are nice here. Like, Minnesota, people say they're nice. They ain't nice compared to Iowa. Come on. <laughs> Iowa, nice, right? And I missed Iowa so much. And I, and I remember at the altar, I was just praying and seeking the Lord, and I felt like uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, there's a reason why you miss Iowa so much. It's because I've called you there, and specifically, I've called you to plant churches. And, I, and it was churches, plural, right? So this is just the beginning. I'm not saying I'm going to move away. We're going to raise up people to send to other communities in Iowa to plant churches. That's why we're called Sent Church, because we never want to be just about us. We want to be about the cities around us as well that don't know Jesus. So I'm going to boldly say right now, God's going to help us plant other churches, right? Come on, somebody. Can we just give God praise for that? I just believe that's going to happen. This is just the first. Okay, so... Uh, for some of you who feel called to ministry, which I know there's uh, several of you, maybe God is going to ask you to plant a church. But, but anyways, uh, God was speaking to my heart about that. And I remember those church planters, they shared these statistics that just really grabbed my heart for church planting. One statistic they shared was they said in 1900, there was, only, or there was 28 churches per every 10,000 Americans. And in 2011, it got all the way down uh, to 11 churches per every 10,000 Americans. So we wonder why the church is losing ground in our country. There's a, there's a number of reasons, but I think one of them is we're not keeping up with population growth. See, the population has grown by, or it's quadrupled, and, and churches have only grown by 50%. So we're not keeping up with, with population growth. We need more churches. That's why if someone else wants to plant a church in the Cedar Valley, I say, come on, we need more churches, right? We've got tons of people who don't know Jesus. Tons of different kinds of churches can reach different kinds of people. We need more churches in our community. We need more churches in Iowa. We need more churches across the United States and across the world. They share those statistics, and I remember... Uh, and when those church planters were uh, there's up there uh, preaching and sharing, I was like, I could never be like those guys. I could never do something like that for God. I could never make a difference. And it's just amazing today uh, to think about how God called us about 16 months ago to plant this church, and here we are today, right? God can use weak people. I'm not very good at this. I'm not going to lie to you, right? You're probably not very good at what God's called you to do, but that's because God wants to take your weakness and turn it into his strength. He wants to take your humility and use it to change people, to change nations, right? That's the thing. I, I felt at the altar, I felt so insignificant. I was like, God, how could this happen? How could I, I be used to plant churches? And in 2015, we came back. We actually started leading uh, the Chi Alpha as the directors. And I was just a little bit confused. I knew God was asking us to do that, but I was like, God, I thought you called me to plant churches. And I, I just walked in obedience. I 
I knew uh, that Chi Alpha was just an assignment. I came back in 2015. There's about like maybe 15 to 20 students left in Chi Alpha and just kind of cast a vision and say, hey, God wants to make disciples on the campus of you and I. Do you want to be a part of it? I threw everybody into leadership right away. Bad idea. Don't do that. Uh, I had to put out a lot of fires. But, but it's amazing over the last five years, or from, or from, and this year as well, the last six years, is we've just seen God do amazing things on the campus. And, and despite all the good things that God was doing in Chi Alpha and all the people getting changed, like, it was amazing. We got to baptize 88 students in water in those five years. Like, 88 students I got to help dunk. Well, some of them I didn't get to because a small group leader took my spot. That's okay. I'm still bitter about some of them, but, but I got to help dunk a lot of students. And it was amazing what God was doing in Chi Alpha, but despite that, I still felt this call to church planting. I could not get it off my mind. My brother Derek, who's been a part of the journey with me really from the beginning, who leads worship, and he's now the Chi Alpha director, he remembers this discontentment in my spirit. I would have like, I love Chi Alpha, but I think I'm called to church planting. And I also, at the same time, what was hard is I felt called to church planting, but I also felt called to this community. I felt called to the students of Chi Alpha. So I was like, how can I be called to both of these things? And I was wrestling through that in prayer. And in June of 2019, I met with my pastor from high school, uh, or Pastor Rich Green. He pastors a church in Coralville. He is an amazing guy. He's going to preach here someday. Pastor Rich, if you watch these, which I doubt it, but if you do, you're going to preach here sometime. So anyways, I met with him in June of 2019, and I shared my heart uh, for church planting. I shared my heart for the students. It's like, how does this all work? And he's like, man, you're supposed to plant a church in Cedar Falls. It's obvious. And I was like, in Cedar Falls? I was like, okay. I don't... There were some different things that had to come together for us to plant this church in Cedar Falls. And I remember just being really nervous, really scared. Like, how is this going to work? How are we going to transition Chi Alpha into church planting? How are we going to do this? And he boldly spoke over me. He said, Daniel, uh, this area of Iowa, which is Cedar Falls down through Iowa City, so it's this whole corridor, is the fourth least Bible-minded area in the entire nation. He said, there's only... 39% Uh, 39% of people who go to church in this area. He said, there needs to be more churches. So he spoke that over me, and I said, God, I'm not going to plant a church unless you really call me to this. So it can't just be Pastor Rich speaking this over me. I need to hear from you. I need to hear a word from the Lord. I told the Lord, I said, I will not plant this church unless someone comes to me who knows nothing about this situation and tells me I'm supposed to plant a church. And essentially that happened in September of 2019. I had prayed and fasted, not straight through, but for three months I prayed and fasted off and on for this. And in September I got a word from the Lord from somebody who knew nothing about this and said essentially through an image, she said you're uh, supposed to plant a church. And then we stepped in uh, to this in October of 2019. At the same time, the pastor who pastored this church uh, formally, he was out on the grass mowing the lawn and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, close the church. Okay, weird, right? Same time that I felt called to plant the church here, he felt called to close his church. You know, it was kind of, there wasn't as many people part of the church. It was kind of getting towards the end of its life. He's about to retire. He felt called to plant, or to close this church. I see this church building come up for sale in November of 2019. I see it for sale sign. And I just thought in my head, I said, wouldn't that be cool if we got that building? And I didn't think anything else about it. And then a pastor friend called me, Pastor Jason Sickles. He pastors a great church in Waterloo called Celebration Church. He called me and said, hey, man, I heard this building's coming for sale. You need to try to get that building. So I boldly went and talked to the pastor and said, hey, will you give it to us? That didn't work out quite, but hey, I tried. (laughs) Because we had no money, right? No money, no people over the age of 25. I was the oldest person in our church at that point, right? So we hadn't had a service yet. So I asked him, didn't work out, that's okay. And uh, and the building actually sold. I told this whole story in February, so I won't share the whole thing again. You can look at the service from, I think, February 7th. It was our Vision Sunday. I shared this story. But then COVID hit in March of 2020, and I'm thinking, how in the world are we going to do this? You know, again, this weakness. I just felt so weak. I'm like, I'm really not that good at getting people to come and be a part of something before it actually exists. There's some people who are gifted with that. I'm not. Like, I'm like, yeah, do your thing, man. If you don't want to be part of it, that's fine. I'm just not that good at inspiring a group of people to say, hey, be part of this new thing that doesn't exist yet. And I was like, God, how am I going to do this during COVID? We, it's a financial recession. People are scared to go in public. How in the world are we going to do this? And, and there's no space to meet. I met with the Waterloo schools to meet there, and it didn't work out there. We actually finally got an email that we might be able to meet there this fall. So I'm just <laughs> I did get an email this last week after a year. That's okay. But uh, so anyways, that didn't work out. I said, where are we going to meet? God brought the Hilton into our lives at just the right time. And I think it was May of 2020. And, and the Hilton was amazing, right? I'm so thankful for that, that team there. Leslie, if you ever see Leslie at the Hilton, she's amazing. I don't know if she watches these, but also you are incredible. Thank you for everything you've done. Uh, so we planted the church in September, and God blew our minds as people actually wanted to be a part of it. And, and then uh, the whole story you've heard before, 
uh, that I shared in February, but essentially through negotiations over the course of 16 months, we're finally able to purchase this building and now here we are, right? So I share all this to say, there were so many obstacles in the way. From the time I was in chapel, right? So here's a secret about, there's a secret about me, well, especially back then, I was very scared to speak in front of people. So I felt called to be a pastor and to preach, but I didn't want to speak in front of people. So the point is, all these obstacles that I faced over the last 10 years, in Chi Alpha, through the journey, and God removes them every time. This week on Wednesday, this room was tore apart. Someone came into men's ministry and said, it looks worse than it did last week. I said, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> And God brought everything together. It was crazy. Like we got our last uh, stuff we needed to put in the dumpster and then the dumpster guy pulled up right after we got it in there. And it was just like crazy stuff this week, just timing, okay? So I'm saying all this to say that this is an only God church. Come on, somebody. Now I'm going to start jumping around. This is an only God church. We don't have a lot of money, but somehow we were able to do everything we wanted to do in here. Everything we wanted to do. There's a few things we could still do, but that's just like extra stuff. We'll see, okay? God is the one who is doing this. Jesus is the one who has sent us. We are sent, church, because Jesus Christ of Nazareth has sent us to the Cedar Valley to preach the gospel, to heal, to cast out demons. He has sent us here. This is not on our own strength, and if it ever becomes on our own strength, I want to be done with it, right? Because I want the Holy Spirit to inspire every single thing we do. I do not want to be an only man church who does everything on our own strategies and own ideas. I want to be an only God church that could only exist if the Holy Spirit was blown on it. But I want people to come in here and be transformed, not because I'm a great preacher, but because the Holy Spirit shows up. I want this church to be a church that is desperately reliant upon the Holy Spirit and knows who has sent them. I'm totally off my notes. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, so can we stand to our feet right now? Let's stand to our feet and let's give God a big praise, all right? I know you're comfortable, but I believe he deserves it. So let's just give him praise. I'm going to make you do it for a little bit. Come on. somebody all right you can sit down you can sit down all right so with that said we're concluding our sermon series heartbeat okay as we were moving into this building I felt like it was so important for us to go back to why we were planted which is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ mission is our heartbeat mission is why we exist mission is why we were planted we want to truly be a sent church that just lives on mission every day we want to introduce people to Jesus throughout the week and look for divine opportunities to share his love. And we want to invite people to join us on Sunday mornings to encounter God's love. We want this to be a welcoming place. So if you call Center Church Home, that's your responsibility alongside everyone else to make this a welcoming place. When someone new comes in, we want them to feel loved and welcomed and to be able to encounter God. We want to be a church that is all about those who are lost and don't know Jesus. As we approach Easter next week, we did 5,000 door hangers. Well, you know, 4,000 so far, but we got 1,000 left. We're going to do them. And we sent out 20,000 mailers this week. Okay, so we don't get at least five people from that. I don't know what's going what's to happen. But the point is, uh, with Easter coming up, with us being in a new building, I just believe this is a unique opportunity to, uh, to introduce people to Jesus. And we really want to seize this moment. And that's also why we're moving to two services. You can see we need two services because this is almost full in here, right? You don't want to be cheek to cheek. We might need to go to three. Please, Holy Spirit, just like make this room bigger so we don't have to go to three. That's going to be a lot of preaching. But... Uh, all right, so this last week of Heartbeat, I want to talk about our mission. I want to go back to the basics and talk about why we were planted, talk about, or talk about, or talk about our mission in general. Uh, back in June 2019, when I met with that pastor, right after I met with him, I started praying about a church name. Because I'm like, okay, if we're planting a church, I need a church name. And I came to John 20, 21. It says this. It says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. In that moment, Jesus gave me the name for the church and the vision of being a church that is for the one, which is the one who doesn't know Jesus in our community, for the city, so we want to be here for the good of our city, or the good of our city. We don't want to be a nuisance. We want to uh, work for its flourishing, right? In a city, in a church that's for the world, which is why we bring in missionaries every other week, it feels like. You're like, I got to give money to a missionary again? It's because we want to be for the world, right? God spoke that to me, and I was like, you really want us to be called Sent Church? That's so weird, come on, God, why is that in church? But I felt like the Lord was saying, that's what you're supposed to be called because I want you to, to always remember why you were planted. With that in mind, I want to go back to the basics, back to the beginning. Let's go to John 20 today. So if you turn there in your Bibles, I want to teach this passage for us. We haven't done this yet as a church. kind of funny. And all these weeks we haven't talked about it, but I felt like the Lord was saving it for this Sunday. 
And before we read this text, it's important to know that Jesus had just been crucified on the cross. We're going to celebrate that on Friday, and he was risen from the grave. We'll celebrate that on Easter. He appeared to his disciples, and, and they could hardly believe what they were seeing. The man who they followed for three years, who was killed brutally on a cross, and had been in the grave for three days with no breath in his lungs, had come up out of the grave. And they're like, what in the world does this mean? What do we do now? Okay, so that's what they're asking. And then Jesus says this in verse 19 of John 20. What well, it says this? It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the, or then the disciples were glad when they had saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it's withheld. All right, let's pray. So Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that this word will come to life. God, I pray that you would speak through us. Holy Spirit, we see here in this passage that Jesus has breathed on us. He has given us the Holy Spirit. So speak to us, Holy Spirit. Be in this room today and illuminate these scriptures to us. God, change our hearts today. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Jesus comes and he proclaims peace over them, which I love that about Jesus. He says that all the time, peace be with you. He says it all throughout, specifically the Gospel of John, but he says, peace be with you. So this morning, if that's all you need, peace be with you, in Jesus' name. Right? He wants to give you peace. Jesus is all about giving us peace and grace and joy. We're going to kind of talk about that on Easter in the following weeks. Excited for that. But he says, peace be with you. He says, replace your sorrow and your turmoil uh, with peace. It's been a hard few days. You cut off an ear, Peter. Now the ear's back on. It's been a crazy few days. You've been hiding out in an upper room like a bunch of scared boys. Peace be with you. I've defeated death. And, And then Jesus tells them what's next for them. He tells them, just as he had come to earth to make salvation available through his death and resurrection. He is now sending them out into the world to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the message of salvation and forgiveness. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit is going to be with them to enable them to do this. And through their ministry, many people will be restored to God. Matthew 28 gives us the same story with a little bit different language. It kind of gives us more details about what Jesus had said. It says this, "'Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations,' baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so he was sending them out to push the kingdom forward by making disciples, by making little Jesuses who would obey him. The call that Jesus gave his disciples that day is the same call that each of us have today if we profess faith in Jesus. If you profess faith in Christ, you are a sent one. You are sent to make disciples of all nations to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to teach people to obey him. It's not just pastor's jobs, right? It's our job to go out to our city, preach the gospel, make disciples, teach people to obey Jesus. We are sent ones. We must live on mission. We must live under this reality that Jesus has sent us to our friends and to our community to bring heaven to earth. That is our mandate as followers of Christ. I want to say three things this morning about our sentness, okay? So it comes from the three verses. Okay, so the first thing is here in John, what well, comes from uh, verse 21 and then 22. So I think 23 as well, sorry. So, so verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. First point this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, we're in a new building, take some notes. Okay, first point, we are sent by Jesus. You're like, whoa, that's groundbreaking. Yeah, it is. Let's, let's get into it. Okay, so if we're going to live as sent ones, we need to know who has sent us. We have been sent by none other than Jesus Christ, the king of the universe. I think this has three implications for us. Being sent by Jesus means we've been sent by a worthy king. If you're going to live this life of mission with joy and effectiveness, you need to remember that you're sent by a worthy king because living a life of mission can be tough. All right, just ask John Griffin. He was here until 1.30 building that drum cage on one night. It was a fun night for him. He got a little grumpy, but he's good. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Point is, living a life of mission can be tough. 
God's going to call you to sacrifice. He's going to call you to lay down your life for other people. It means you have to leave everything that holds you back from being all that God has called you to be. And, and Luke's gospel really captures this. Like the whole gospel is like, leave everything, follow Jesus, deny yourself, grit your teeth, and go after Jesus. Take up your cross. Luke's gospel really captures this. In Luke 5, when the disciples first begin to follow Jesus, it says they left everything to follow him. They left their nets, they left everything. In Luke, or in the same chapter, we looked at this last week, Levi leaves his his prosperous occupation of tax collecting to follow Jesus. We talked about that last week. In Luke 9, when Jesus sends out his disciples to preach and to heal, he says, take nothing for your journey. He told them, or he told them later on in that chapter that if they want to follow him, then they'll have to deny themselves, take up their crosses, and follow Jesus. If they want to save their lives, they're going to have to lose them. In Luke 14, Jesus tells his disciples that if they want to follow him, then they must hate their fathers, and mothers, and wives, and children, and brothers, and sisters, compared to how much they love him. So don't actually hate your children. But Jesus says, hate them in comparison to how much you love me. They have to renounce all that they have to be his disciple. Ooh, this is weighty stuff. You're like, I thought we were just going to celebrate today. What's going on here? To be, or to be uh, disciples of Jesus, we must follow the same call. We must deny ourselves take up our crosses and follow him. We must renounce all that we have. We must love him so much that it, that it looks like we hate everything else in comparison to how much we love him. The only way you're going to be able to do this, the only way you're going to be able to hate your father, mother, and children is if you know that Jesus is a worthy king. He's worthy of everything you got. Come on. He's worthy of every single thing you have. He is worthy. He's compassionate He's merciful, he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is slow to anger. He is wholly just and righteous. And at the same time, he's completely loving and full of mercy. Ooh, this Jesus. Can we talk about Jesus right now? Come on, Jesus. When he walked this earth, he was so strong and masculine that strong men dropped their necks. But at the same time, he was so tender and loving and kind that in a culture where women felt mistreated, where they... Uh, were really pushed down. They felt comfortable with him. Women followed Jesus. A lot of women followed him. Children felt comfortable to come sit on his lap. And he was like a religious teacher, right? Someone with authority. They felt comfortable to come sit on his lap. This Jesus is unlike anything we can even understand. So strong, but so tender. He is worthy of everything we have. He is worthy of renouncing it all for him. Being sent by Jesus also means we go into the world as Jesus did. Okay, so what did Jesus do in the world? He went into cities and proclaimed the gospel that he had come to take away the sins of the world. He announced the arrival of a new kingdom, not a political kingdom, not a new set of rules, but a proclamation that he is Lord. We need to proclaim this in our community, that Jesus is king, that he is Lord, and he has given his life so that we might be saved. He also healed sick people. He casted out demons. No matter where he went, he brought He brought restoration with him he pushed back darkness and we need to push back darkness as well and not only that but he spent most of his time investing his life into 12 men and in the same way we need to pour our lives into other people raising them up for kingdom work being sent by jesus means one more thing it means that he is preparing the way for us in our kingdom efforts he's going before us he's preparing the way we don't have to do it on our own strength He's preparing hearts. He loves people more than you do. He loves the people you're trying to reach with the gospel more than you do. Do you believe that? He went before you yesterday on the outreach day when you uh, brought up those door hangers. He goes before us. He wants us to lead people to him. It's not on us to do it on our own strength. We're simply partnering with the king in his mission. I believe this is incredibly liberating to know that Jesus has sent us, that he has ordained our mission. It's not something we came up with. Sent church is not our idea. It's not on us. It's on Jesus. It's not on you or me to build this church. We're simply messengers of a great and mighty king who's stronger than us, and we can trust that he will work on hearts. He will pave the way for revival in the Cedar Valley. Mmm, revival. I could talk about that. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says this, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's what Chi Alpha means. If you've been wondering, what the heck does Chi Alpha mean? It means Christ ambassadors. Okay, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
An ambassador is someone who simply carries a message for someone who is stronger than them. So like ambassador to the United Nations carries a message from the president, right? It's this idea that, that you're not the one who's in charge, you're carrying the message of another. That's what we're doing for Jesus. We are carrying his message throughout the earth. We aren't Christ. We can't control people. We can't change hearts. But we can proclaim the message. We can love people. We can give people opportunity for healing. We need to know this as we move forward with this church plant, as we build out that direction in a couple of years, in Jesus' name, as we build out a parking lot over there because we need more room. We need to know that Christ is the one who's building this church. It's not on us. We need to work hard, we need to pray hard, but at the end of the day, we need to rest easy at night knowing that Jesus is working on hearts all across our city. Verse 22 says this. It says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Spirit, or receive the Holy Spirit. The second point this morning is we are sent in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not a coincidence that just after Jesus tells them that they're sent out, into the world that he gives them the Holy Spirit. He knew that these guys were hopeless without the Spirit of God. He knew if it's relying upon them, this kingdom ain't going for it. It's about to die. Right? They need the Holy Spirit. And the same applies to us. We think we can do it on our own, but we can't. We need the Spirit of God to have an authentic move happen in our city. We can build a church that you know, does things well and people like it and it's comfortable. We can do that on our own. But if we want to see revival in 2021, we need the Holy Spirit. If we want people to go from death to life, we need the Holy Spirit of God to empower us. In Acts 1-8, just a little bit after this conversation, he says this. He says, but you will receive power ooh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus knew that if his disciples were going to reach the world, they would need the Spirit of God to give them boldness to proclaim this message, even in the midst of opposition. And if we think we face opposition, we better read Acts, right? Because they're getting stoned, not pot, but stoned with rocks, okay? <laughs> Some of you are like, what? All right, they're getting, it's been a long week. I got like four hours of sleep per night. So if I say weird stuff today, you got to forgive me, okay? Okay, so they're getting stoned, they're getting beat, they're getting put in prison. And I just read the other day, Acts 16, they're in prison, and they're just like, hallelujah, Lord, we're in prison, yeah. Like, they faced so much opposition, but they would press forward because they had the Spirit of God with them. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts hearts. He's the one who leads people to repent. We don't do it, we're not that good at it. John 16, verse 8, and when he comes, the Holy Spirit he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. If we're going to do what God has called us to do, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah, the prophet gets at this idea. God is calling Israel to, or to rebuild the temple. I felt like we did that this week. We're like, rebuilding a temple is fun. So that they can worship God. And they're facing so much opposition. He faces so much opposition. They didn't have enough people to help build. They didn't have enough money to do it. And they faced opposition from the government. And this is what God said to the governor who was in charge of the rebuilding. It says this in verse 6 of Zechariah chapter 4. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. I love that name. Not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Only through God's spirit would the temple be rebuilt. And the same applies to us as we build the church in the Cedar Valley. Not by our might, not by our abilities, not by our strength, but by the Holy Spirit. And everything we do, not just with church stuff, right? And your jobs, with your family. It's hard to be a good dad. For men out there who are dads, it's hard at times, right? For moms, it's hard. Like you're up all night, you're like, will you just go to bed, child? <laughs> not by our might, Ooh, not by our abilities, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What would it look like if in everything we did, we relied upon the Holy Spirit, no matter how mundane the task is? The Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary that the world has ever seen, the greatest church planter. He was so good at it. And he wrote most of the books of the New Testament. And this is what he said about his ministry. It says this in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to, or to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. Mm, I love that. And in fear and much trembling in my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power i want power god come on help us so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of god 
He did not rely on persuasion or his own wisdom, but on the strength of the power of God. He wasn't trying to give a good explanation, but he was trying to give a powerful demonstration of God's power. Let that be us, Lord, please. When we first followed the call of God in planting this church, we had no idea what difficulties awaited us. I tell you, when you say you're going to plant a church, the devil gets really mad. I don't know what it is like. I just faced stuff that I've never faced before. We faced difficulties with people thinking we were crazy for doing it, relational strife. I got mono like two days after we said we were going to plant the church. And I'm not trying to say every, like, the devil's behind every bush, okay? But I've never got mono before. And I get mono. I'm like, I didn't even kiss anybody besides my wife. Okay, I don't know what's going on. And I was out of it for like a month, just out of it. There's so much doubt I wrestled with. I, uh, this morning I was reading through my journals, and, and this time last year, guys, I was not confident. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? There's a pandemic hitting our world. I was just like, God, what are we doing? And all the church planning books I read, they never told me how to plant a church in the middle of a pandemic and economic recession. They had all these good ideas, but I'm like, it doesn't apply, okay? We can't do that. We can't do bouncy houses out in the parking lot. <laughs> it's been a lot harder to gather people. Like fundraising, I tell you guys, fundraising was so hard last summer for our portable startup. It was a lot easier this time. God really came through, but it was hard. People weren't looking to give out money when they're like, I don't know if I'm going to keep my job, right? It was such a struggle. It's insane to think about how the Holy Spirit has carried us through, though. When I reflect on everything that's happened this past year, I can't believe we're standing here this morning. This shouldn't have happened. Only by the Spirit of God has this happened. This church was not planted on our own strength. God made it so it couldn't happen on our own strength. He's like, every idea you have, throw it out the window. He's ain't going to work. This building was not bought because we have a ton of resources. You know that story. No way. This has only happened because God decided to show up. Where our abilities and resources ran out, his power and provision came through. Where we are weak, he is strong. I pray that we would always be a people who do not rely on eloquence or strength or strategy, but on the Holy Spirit's strength. The best place to be is a place where we realize we cannot do it on our own. This place where we're humble before God and say, God, we need you, because God gives grace to the humble and he opposes the proud. Let us utterly humble ourselves before God. Like I said, tears in the carpet, right? Praying for God. Midweek prayer is going to start being here on Wednesday. I just decided that like two seconds ago. Okay, so <laughs> it popped in my head. So on Wednesday, we're going to pray here. We're going to seek God's face, not just on Zoom like, hey, can I unmute it now? Hello, guys. I'm praying. <laughs> but going after God, okay? And I love the Zoom prayer. So for those of you who have been there, thank you. All right, so one more thing this passage shows us about our call to be sent ones for Jesus. It says this in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it's withheld. Third point, we are sent to restore the lost to their father. As we are sent to the Cedar Valley, we cannot forget what we are sent with. We are sent with a message of forgiveness. This message is called the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In verse 23 of our passage, Jesus says that his disciples have the authority to forgive. When I read that, I'm like, whoa, me? Authority to forgive? How am I going to do that? God only forgives, right? This doesn't mean we actually are the ones who do the forgiving. What it means is he has entrusted us with the message that can lead to forgiveness, right? We have the message. We have the keys to being forgiven. How are people forgiven? Well, Romans 10 tells us that if they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead, then they will be saved. So we're called to go and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that he has died on the cross for the sins of the world and call people to repent and to confess that he is Lord. If we want to be forgiven, we have to believe this gospel, this good news. Peter describes the gospel in this way in 1 Peter. He says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus Christ took our sins on himself. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. This is the message of the gospel. It's the message we are called to proclaim and we should never get tired of it. It should never get old to us. That should mess with us. By his wounds we are healed. Whoa, Jesus, king of the universe, came out of heaven, lived as a baby. He pooped in a diaper. I shouldn't say poop. He... He lived a perfect life. And then he's brutally killed on a cross for our sake. He knew everything I would do. He knew the terrible things I would do. And yet he still died for me. He still died for you. 
That should mess with this church. That should really mess with our hearts. And then he didn't just do that, though. He rose up from the grave. He said, death does not have the final word. Mm. God's heart burns for the lost in our community. It burns for the lost. He hurts for the lost. And this message is the key to them receiving forgiveness. We have to go and proclaim it and demonstrate it. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate water baptisms. And I'm excited to say that I think there's around 20 people getting baptized. Come on, somebody. I cannot wait to celebrate those decisions. We're going to have like five baptisms per service. When people get baptized in water, it's our declaration to the world that our old life is dead and gone and we are raised to life with Christ. That's what we're going to be declaring, those who get baptized, that you are raised to life with Christ. Baptism in the first century was a big deal because when you got baptized, you were telling a hostile government, a hostile people that you are with Jesus. You're not holding back. You're going public with your faith. So that's what you're doing over the next few weeks for those of you who are getting baptized. You are going public and saying, I'm with Christ. You're putting a target on your back saying, I am with him. Especially in the first century, that's what it would have been like. It's a big deal going public with our faith. So if you haven't been baptized and you know Jesus, get baptized. So you can still sign up, right? Let's go public with our faith. We, this is why we exist, though. As, as we baptize those 20 people, let it stir our hearts and say, this is why we exist. This is what it's all about, to see people raised to life. We exist to help our friends become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That is what we are about. All right, the main idea this morning is this. Our heartbeat must always be to remember that we are sent by Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to restore lost sons and daughters to their father. If you remember that, then I think you'll be okay. All right, we are sent by Jesus in the power of the Spirit to restore people to their heavenly father. I believe there might be three different groups of people in this room this morning. You know, some of you came in and, and you have a relationship with Jesus already. And you are his disciple. You love Jesus so much. When I meet with you or talk to you, I'm like, dang, this person loves the Lord. And you've been living as a saint. When you're one of those people who just, you share the gospel. But if you're honest, you're a little tired. You're a little discouraged. Maybe you worked at the building all week and you're like, I am so tired, right? Or maybe this pandemic has just done a number on you. You're struggling with fear. You're struggling with all the this, this stuff going on and you're just wore out. Or maybe you've been praying for your friends to know Jesus and it just seems like nothing is happening in their hearts. I believe Jesus just wants to encourage you this morning. He wants to encourage you to stay the course, keep being faithful. It's not your job to change hearts. It's only your job to be an ambassador. That's your job. Love Jesus, love people, be an ambassador. He wants to encourage your heart this morning. Spend time with him every day. Abide with him and let him work through you. It's not on you. You're not that powerful. You're not that powerful. It's not on you. Stop carrying that burden. I just feel right now, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying there's people carrying burdens this morning, these burdens of evangelism even. It's like a big heavy yoke on your back. No, 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 let Jesus carry that burden. Be free and just share the love of Jesus with everyone who he gives you opportunity to share with. Just share it and let God work on hearts. Holy Spirit, I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit right now, God, I just pray that you bring freedom in this place from the burdens, God, these yokes that get put on us as followers of Jesus. God, help us just to be ambassadors. Help us to walk with joy. Help us to be like the Apostle Paul who gets stoned and he gets up with joy on his face, goes back into the city, starts preaching again. God, help us to have this joy in our hearts. Oh, yes, Jesus. Help us, Holy Spirit. God, help us to never do this on our own strength. Encourage us, God. God, just help your love to flow through us, Lord. That's all it takes. I pray that our hearts would be just conduits for your presence, for your, for your love. I just pray that they would flow through and it would not be a thing where we're just trying to pull up our bootstraps and do it on ourselves or doing our own strength, God. We don't need to prove anything. God, I pray that you take that away. Anyone who feels the need to prove anything in this place, I pray in the name of Jesus that that would be gone. You don't have to prove anything. Jesus already proved it on the cross when he died for you. You don't have to prove nothing. But God, I do pray that each person in this place would, would feel the responsibility and each of us would go out and share your love. All right, sorry for that impromptu prayer. <laughs> There's another group of us this morning who you call yourself a follower of Jesus, but you're not living as a sent one. And again, you do not need to take on condemnation this morning. The beautiful thing about Jesus 
In Romans 8, 1, it says, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. So no condemnation this morning. That's not from Jesus. Take that, throw it out the window. Okay, but conviction, where you feel called to come up higher, you, and you feel called to get into the game, that's definitely from the Holy Spirit. It's not always fun, but he's calling you to, to rise up and to be the son or daughter that he's called you to be. So if you have not been living as a sent one, if you have not been sharing the love of Jesus, he wants to encourage you this morning that he has given you the Holy Spirit. He's empowered you to push back darkness in your little silo, the thing we talked about last week, silos, uh, these areas of influence. He has empowered you. You are called to bring the message of Jesus to your friends. So I pray this morning that you would take up that call, that you'd receive the power of the Holy Spirit and go take up that call. And there's others who walked in this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you once did and you've walked away. Maybe you've been kind of going through the motions. You look like you're a Christian, but you're not. Or maybe you just aren't a Christian at all. This morning, I pray that you would hear the gospel, that Christ came for sinners. Ooh, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I pray that you'd hear that this morning. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. While you're messed up, all the terrible thoughts you think, all the terrible things you do, I'm talking about me too, right? Christ died for you. He loves you. God loves you. I pray this morning that you would hear that gospel and you would respond to it. It is good news. We need good news. I pray that the gospel would change your heart this morning, that you would experience what Paul talked about in chapter 1, verse 16 of Romans, where he says, it's the power of God. I pray that you would experience that this morning. All right, let's stand all across this room. What an amazing day, right? We're in our new building. It's only 10, 15, and we've already had a party. Come on, somebody. You guys are the early risers. You're like, I'm ready. It's been a good day already. I can't believe we're here, but, but the thing we need to remember is it's not about the building, right? It's not about the building. This is just kind of like a, or like a center. It's like a hub where we send people out all week, right? It's a hub. We come back on Sunday. We get recharged, filled up, encouraged. We go back out. It's a hub. It's not about the building. It's about being sent. We are on a mission to reach the 61,000 people who do not belong to a church. We're on a mission to reach the 61,000 in the state of Raleigh who need Jesus. We are on mission. We are sent ones. So this morning, this is my prayer for you. If you know Jesus, I pray that you would lay it all down. Anything you've been holding on to and saying, I want to keep that, that Jesus is saying you need to let go, lay it down. And say, Jesus, here I am, send me. So bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. So we're going to do this a little bit different today. We're going to respond to that first. Okay, so if you're a follower of Jesus here and you just feel that God is calling you to lay it all down for him, I want you to slip up your hand right now all across this room. See those hands. I just want to pray a prayer that God would empower us with his spirit. He would help us to do this. All right, so let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would empower us all across this room to carry your message of salvation to this community and to other communities. Holy Spirit, we need you. This is not on us, it's on you. We need you to empower us. Help us to be sent ones. In Jesus' name. All right, I have one more way to respond. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus or you once did and you walked away and today you wanna make a commitment to follow him, if you wanna confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you can receive forgiveness and be saved, I wanna give you a chance to do that. And all we're gonna do is I'm gonna count to three and I want you to slip up your hand just so I know who I'm praying for. And I'll pray for you. And then we're gonna worship, okay? So bow your heads, close your eyes, all across the room. If you're here and you wanna put your trust in Jesus, become his son and daughter, we count to three. When I do, slip up your hand. One, two, three, slip them up all across the room. I see the hand. I see the hand. Is there anyone else? I see the hand. All right, you can put your hands down. I'm just gonna pray a simple prayer. All it takes is a simple prayer of trust. You pray in your heart and just say, Jesus, I need you. That's all you gotta say. All right, so Jesus, this morning we come to you and we thank you for this holy moment. I feel like we're standing on holy ground, God. And God, I pray that these first few people in this building who, have, who are putting their faith in you, God, I pray that, uh, that you would just forgive them right now, Jesus. That you give them a fresh start, Lord, that, that the old life would be dead and gone and that they would step into a new future. Christ, we thank you that, that you made this possible through your death and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's worship one more time.